dat waren fantastische jaren. All of a sudden there was like those fancy Range Rovers driving on the streets and you were like, wow, that's a cool car, man. I want to get one of those. People were buying everything and they just took loans for it. Foreign loans. The sky was the limit. We behaved like total idiots. Big troubles were on the horizon. Ik heb nooit niet verder gedacht dan van dat een bank zou failliet kunnen gaan. Ik vond dat op dat moment absurd. There were some rumors that. Uh... Well, in a few weeks of time, there wouldn't even be food in the stores. My father lost his job for, I think he was there for 35 years or something, and they had to shut down. IJSLAND is drie maal zo groot als België en ligt halfweg tussen Europa en Amerika. De 320.000 inwoners leveren goede voetballers en succesvolle artiesten. Maar doorgaans staat het land niet vooraan in het wereldnieuws, tenzij een vulkaan het Europese luchtverkeer stillegt. Pas in 1944 wordt IJsland volledig onafhankelijk. IJslanders zijn van oorsprong vissers. In het begin van de 20e eeuw is de visindustrie verantwoordelijk voor 90% van het nationaal inkomen. Na de Tweede Wereldoorlog wordt de visindustrie geïndustrialiseerd met een grote welvaartstoename als gevolg. Maar de rijke visgronden zijn ook aantrekkelijk voor buitenlanders. Om die te beschermen breidt IJsland in 1975 haar territoriale wateren uit tot 370 kilometer. Daardoor komt het in aanvaring met Groot-Brittannië, waarbij IJsland aan het langste eind trekt. Dit conflict is ook gekend als de Kabeljauw-oorlogen. Eind 2008 komt het tot een andere grote uitbarsting. Op enkele dagen tijd gaan de drie grootste IJslandse banken failliet. De schade is enorm. De werkloosheid gaat op enkele maanden van minder dan 2% naar 10% van de beroepsbevolking. Voor een land dat in 2007 en 2008 nog nummer 1 stond op de Human Development Index van de Verenigde Naties, zijn dit erg ongewone ontwikkelingen. IJsland heeft veel goedkope en hernieuwbare energie en kon daardoor de aluminiumindustrie aantrekken. En er was nog altijd een zeer boeiende visindustrie. Toch komt de IJslandse overheid rond de e-wisseling met het idee om Wall Street concurrentie aan te doen. There was a decision made uh, by uh, our government to try to uh, create an international financial center. And uh, this, the idea was basically to create a third pillar under the economy that we have fish and we have energy, but we need something to provide jobs for our young educated people. And uh, finance uh, is uh, attractive in many ways. It creates great jobs, there's no pollution, uh, it's, uh, it's employment for both women and men. So there was a decision made around the turn of the century to promote finance here. The problem was there was no history of international finance here. There was no experience. When our banks were privatized, there was substantial cronyism involved so that uh, the people who bought the banks were affiliated with uh, political parties. The distinction between the state that should have protected the public and the financiers who were risking the public <laughs> through all this borrowing was not very uh, strong. So it's a, it's a way of the state helping the bankers, the bankers helping the state, and also paying a lot of taxes that uh, 
help the government increase government expenditures. Or, so, so it was a, there were no checks and balances, you know. And uh, this went on until 2008. And then there was a collapse. I don't know why they picked finance as a third pillar of the economy. It was, a, in retrospect, a crazy idea. Olafur Peterson is huisschilder toen hij zich in 2007 in de toeristische sector waagde. Hij investeert in motorhomes die hij aan toeristen verhuurt. I decided first of course to buy just uh, just one to try to see if I will get some some market and and uh, the first day it was sold out. So and I went to this uh, dealer, motorhome dealer and he said uh, How many do you think you can rent? I said, I think I can rent seven. So, so we just ordered seven, seven motorhomes. And uh, it was just no problem. It's just, uh, you knew that bank would uh, cover uh, and the uh, only thing you have to have with you when you were dealing such a thing, just a uh, good pen, just to, to sign your name and uh, everything was taken care of. So it was, uh, that was not a problem. When I started to talk about it with, uh, you know, friends I knew which were doing, were in business, they, they said, seven, why, why did you buy seven? Why didn't you buy 70? Can't you rent out 70? Why don't you buy 70? And I was thinking, mm, yeah, why, why should I not buy 70? But I mean, <laughs> that, 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 that was, uh, too big for me, but uh, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of people would have, a lot of guys would have just bought 70, because it doesn't matter. You didn't have to have anything, anything yourself. I mean, just good, good name and good, yeah, credit in the bank, which uh, almost everyone had. If you had your own house and were, were maybe doing some small businesses, then the bank saw you. You had a good story in the bank, and then they were ready to increase it. You know. There was some craze going on here, like in 2007, specifically in 2007. A huge part of the nation was participating in this craze. Everyone were praising the banks and those guys who were investing abroad and so on. The period of 2003 to 2008 was, of course, a period of optimism. And we were, could do a, anything, almost. There was a lot of money and, and there was a, quite a boom in, in Iceland. The economic atmosphere was, uh, could be described as being uh, euphoric, that people were very optimistic. Uh, they were enjoying high living standards. Um, there was a continuous flow of money into the country, making uh, the exchange rate very high, uh, imports were cheap, people could borrow at low interest rates, and uh, there was a massive consumption boom. Ik had zelf in België gewoond en gewerkt. En ik, ik heb altijd gezegd van, ik heb het hier wel heel goed. En het leven dat ik hier heb opgebouwd in circa ja, drie jaar, vier jaar tijd, kon ik nooit opbouwen in België, materieel en zo. Ik had een huis, we hadden twee wagens, 
Uh, ik ging drie, vier maal per jaar op reis. En in België was dat gewoon niet mogelijk. Uh, het, het, okay, je had je salaris ook, net zoals hier, maar op het einde van de maand was het meestal op. Maar hier was er altijd veel overschot. Dus er was ja, voldoende extra geld om, 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 van, om van het leven te genieten. For the public, it was also quite good. Um, you had lower taxes, more government services, cheap imports. Uh, you could borrow as much as you wanted. Um, so in that sense, uh, it was a paradise. But it was a, a rather unhealthy country in that uh, the, the mentality of the people was, uh, uh, was more, uh, it was unhealthy how much the, 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 the place that money took and, and consumption and material goods and the, the worshipping of these uh, financiers in the papers and the media. You had all these personality cults around these people who were effectively running the country. Arnar Vidarsson is een IJslandse voetballer die het gemaakt heeft in België. Hij komt in 1998 als profvoetballer bij Lokeren terecht en daarna bij Sterkle Brugge. Hij gaat nog geregeld op bezoek in IJsland. Mijn vrouw heeft mij ooit gevraagd, uh, maar Arnar, hoe kan dat nu? Want mijn vrouw is een Belgische en, 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 en denkt gelijk een Vlaming. En zij vroeg aan mij, maar Arnar, hoe kan dat nu? Dat Als je juist afgestudeerd bent, je zit 21 jaar, dat je een appartement koopt en dat je daar vier flatscreens in kunt zetten en uh, stereo's en, en een, een, een dikke jeep voor, op, de, op de oprit. Mijn antwoord was ja, dat, dat is nu gewoon eenmaal zo in IJsland op dit moment. Je zag de, de, de appartementen, de huizen uit de grond komen uh, zoals niks. Uh. En persoonlijk stelde ik mij ook wel altijd de vraag van voor wie zijn die huizen? Want oké, okay, ja, we waren toen maar met 300.000 inwoners en ik had niet zo het gevoel van gaan we plotseling met, met 500.000 mensen zijn. Ik had dan altijd zo het gedacht van oké, okay, ja, dat zal voor de elfen en de trollen zijn dat ze huizen aan het bouwen zijn en, en dat, dat voer ik mij wel af. I always thought people were hurrying, like finish their education, so they could, um, so they could uh, start working at a bank and wear their suits with a tie, go have fine, like fancy lunches, and uh, you know, go to cocktail parties. Said I remember when we used to say, in the morning got down and drenched down. The government y'all say. Sometimes I did talk about that with my friends in music, because uh, obviously we were spending all this time working for a bank, and we didn't have the time then to uh, to create stuff, not as much as we do today. I mean, you would go and like take half an hour and be like, okay, yeah, this is good, this is good stuff, but yet it wasn't that wasn't real, real uh, creation, and uh, so we sometimes thought. Are we gonna work in this bank forever, or what are we gonna do? So, uh, but it was not an issue at any point. It was people thought it was cool, I guess, to uh, to work in a bank. I mean, sometimes I think you think that Iceland is the center of the universe. But <laughs> <laughs> I think really, we are, I think we are all uh, have. What do you call it? like illusion of grandeur or something? <laughs> that we are uh, we are much bigger. We think we're much yeah. bigger than we really are. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and you realize that when you go out to the world, 
you see, okay, we are maybe you're not that big, <laughs> but that I think that what's kept us going through all this. We just like a, a man with a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, he can get the the hottest girl, although he's maybe not the hottest himself. <laughs> and uh, it's similar to us. I think we we just believe we can. sort of generally speaking, not only in Iceland, but everywhere in the, the finance market. And it's easy for us to be greedy. <laughs> and, uh, and it's easy to feed greed in people. And that was definitely done in the, in the ECS. To raise our children when the party was going on, it's just terrible. I mean, it gives you a wrong idea about, uh, about life, I mean. Uh, sometimes life can be can be hard, and but there it was. Everything was so easy that you could buy everything and do 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 do, and that was so everything was so easy. Iceland was actually, uh, yeah, and and a Monaco geworden. It was uh, it was here uh, the hemel op aarde for uh, for uh, for for the mensen. It was uh, iedereen had geld, iedereen had genoeg geld, iedereen had misschien te veel geld. We trusted the system of everything. I mean that everything was suddenly so so good that uh, yeah we felt uh, secure. During those years, the, 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 the myth was created that uh, in our culture there was uh, expertise in finance and business that the world was just discovering. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I must say our, our president, uh, the nominal head of state, traveled all over the world uh, making speeches on behalf of our bankers. And some of these speeches have become infamous uh, now. Uh, saying, for example, in one speech that uh, the, 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 the world was learning about the superior skills of the Icelandic businessmen and uh, that this experience would change the way business was taught on both sides of the Atlantic. <laughs> so, so there was a myth created. Anyone who wanted to uh, not believe in this myth was uh, labeled as a pessimist, uh, uh, who did not, um, or, or, or unpatriotic. Uh, uh, so. I, I like to believe that um, the average Icelander is a pretty decent guy. Uh, sometimes a little naive, even though well educated, and uh, usually we can speak more than one language. Uh, but uh, I have said for a long time that. Uh, Icelanders are pretty badly written of a minority complex. We are a very small nation uh, on a rather small island out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we, we, we overestimate ourselves constantly, probably to help our self-esteem, <laughs> so to speak. People would just ask, why, why are Icelanders so rich? And I guess some people, maybe including myself, were saying like, well, our bankers are such brilliant persons. And even people, for example, the president was comparing the bankers to the Vikings. And they had this special element that as Vikings, they could just go over Europe and, and you know, today we look back and we think like, well, this was maybe, it's a bit, we should be more humble in the future. We could do, you know, anything, and we were so special. You know, that was the only thing that we were saying. Like, oh, you can do anything, we're so special. We have this Viking jeans and this elf's jeans, which is just like totally yeah. ridiculous. And, the, you know, the Vikings were raping people, so you shouldn't be happy about it. But still, it was just like that talk, just like, oh, you should be able to do it. So I think the people were more like, like, like yes, we can do it. We are better than the others. We are, you know, different. 
that thought was, I think, more mm. dangerous than the yeah. greed itself. The way we were thinking was not very different from, from the way others were thinking uh, in other countries. So. Generation after generation, we want to improve, we want more, we want uh, improved uh, standards of living. And uh, I think that we just went too fast. We were assured that everything was okay. I mean, things were like they should be. have banks that are run by adventurous uh, people. Uh, they can borrow at low rates abroad because foreigners, foreign creditors, think there's uh, government backing. So uh, these are the commercial banks in the country uh, that has never defaulted. So that was a key to their initial success. But the banks were not run as conservative establishments. They were run in a very reckless way. I remember being uh, a bit worried because uh, I was working in the Ministry of Justice and I was uh, uh, a part of my job was uh, to attend meetings, uh, meeting Nordic colleagues and also uh, meetings in Europe. And uh, I remember that many were beginning to ask, what is happening in Iceland? Where does the money come from? Um, that sort of questions and, and so, I was uh, beginning to be a bit worried. Also that, uh, I mean, we know that the sky isn't the limit. What happened in the run-up to the crisis, in a few key words, is probably that uh, we had a very open economy with full membership of the European internal market. Uh, we had uh, the availability of cheap money in abundance so that the Icelandic banks could easily borrow abroad. All of this contributed to a huge bubble, uh, which then uh, burst in 2008, at the same time as the banks who had grown enormously by accessing foreign liquidity and, and foreign lending uh, were shut off from, uh, from that source of funding through the international financial crisis. So with all of these things combined, when the bubble bursts, it's very easy to get into a spiral of economic difficulties. And the fall in 2008 happened very quickly following the fall of the Lehman Brothers because the liquidity, which we had known since 2007, was essential for the banks, dried up uh, within a very uh, short period. It was a kind of a, like a clock would stop. It just, uh, what, what, what happened? I didn't fully grasp what would be the meaning, what would happen, what would be the consequence. Of course, I was afraid that uh, we would never be up on our feet again. But I was, as every other Icelander, I, I didn't know that the situation was so bad. I hadn't got a clue. All of a sudden, with the uh, law of emergency and, and the prime minister uh, addressing the nation for the first time, for a long time, in, uh, it was a shock to all of us. Of that hand, with Islandska Bjartsini, Æðruleysi og samstöðu af vopni munum við standa stormin af okkur. Guð blessi Ísland. All of a sudden we, we weren't sure if we could trust the politicians, trust the uh, 
institutions and, and, and of course the, the business sector was uh, badly hurt and, and, the, and the banks collapsed just several days later. I remember three days after the collapse, I was, I was studying in Boston University um, and my computer broke down and I was like, damn it, because before the collapse, the dollar was so cheap, but all of a sudden the dollar was so expensive and I was like, why didn't my computer break down earlier? Now I got to go and buy a new one and it's like, it's twice the price. Ik weet nog goed, we waren op vakantie naar Spanje en plotseling horen we dus via het internet dat onze bank failliet ging. En dan hadden we iets van, wow, wat, uh, <laughs> wat gebeurt er? Uh, Oké, okay, je, je zit in Spanje, je bent niet thuis. Uh, plotseling je ziet van, ja, je bank is failliet. Dat is iets van, je bent op reis, gaan we nog straks naar de winkel kunnen gaan en iets aankopen met onze, met onze kaart. Uh, dus dat was wel... En paniek zo ook, en dan zag je plotseling ook die, die, die valuta van je, 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 je kronen. Ja, plotseling, gisteren kostte je pint misschien uh, 300 kronen, en de dag nadien kostte je pint uh, 800 kronen. Die was gewoon op de een of andere dag meer dan dubbel in prijs geworden. Het is een, een heel akelig gevoel als je hard gewerkt hebt voor de centen en je hebt hele. Uh, uh, loopbaan eigenlijk gespaard en nooit geen, geen e extreme dingen gedaan, dat je dan ineens belt naar de bank en ze pakken niet op. De bank bestaat niet meer. I remember being confused and uh, I remember thinking what will happen now? Uh, there were some rumors that uh, well, in a few weeks of time, there wouldn't even be food in the stores. And uh, we were sort of, uh, with our uh, currency, we, we didn't know how it would work out. But, uh, and, and my daughters were worried. And I was telling my daughters that, well, we will be fine one way or the other, because, uh, well, 100 years ago, maybe, or not even that, maybe 60, 70 years ago, my grandfather was practically starving to death. He had, didn't have anything to eat. And they were poor, as, as most Icelanders at the time. Uh, they were farmers, they were uh, seamen. And, uh, but one way or the other, they survived. Most of them, not all of them. But I mean, what I was telling my daughters is that, well, the situation now isn't worse than it was. 70 years ago, we are going to survive. And we have enough to eat, and, and somehow it's going to be okay. Um, we are living in great luxury now, compared to that. And uh, that is what I was telling my daughters, that you can come by with little. You don't have to have everything. Before the crash, so you were always thinking like there was so such an abundance of money that you you thought like oh okay in a few years you can fix everything. There's going to be inflow of money into whatever progress you think has to be made. But after the collapse, you think like oh all of that is unrealistic now. So you would think really differently about how you make progress in the country. So I think in in terms of how you would think the society is going to be better, that kind of collapsed. I, I can say for myself, I, I, sort of in my environment, we hardly t spoke about anything else but the, what was happening in our society. Because it was such a shock. Uh, there was all of a sudden, our society was sort of turned around. And, uh, and we, not, we realized that it was a, a changed society.
Every news hour was filled with, with, uh, with news from, from sort of the crisis. And first of all, uh, we had to explain to the children what is crisis, what does it mean? And they were worried, of course, um, and uh, were asking what is happening and, and why is it, is it happening and what will happen to us? Uh, are we going to move away from home? Uh, that sort of things. And uh, I mean, that was a very important moment for us who were older to, to, to give guidance, to tell them that, okay, I mean, things look bad, but, but uh, we are going to, to go through this. We had a meeting here in the, with our family, with our children, and we were discussing that now everything would be different and uh, it would be more hard to, to I mean, to, to live and to buy food and pay loans for the house. So now everyone should have to do as much as they can. I mean, like we say in Asa, do it uh, more the old way. I mean, you just, if you want to buy something, you have to spare money. At first, you try to figure out what happened, but uh, then you just lost the track and, and there were always coming some new explanations and, and at some point he just turned off the TV and went out. Young people between 20 and 30, they have been investing in their apartments and, and houses maybe and suddenly following the collapse, they, it, it became, well, they may have lost their employment and at the same time the, the loans are getting higher all the time. So there has been a lot of problem with certain age groups, the young people that are coming into the employment market, market and so to some extent they were affected more harshly than those who had already bought their houses and, and, and did not have big loans to pay from. People in general recognized that there was instability, but I think uh, very few people realized the, uh, how, how quickly this could all crumble. And it was widely recognized as early as 2006 that if foreign funding would uh, evaporate, if the markets would dry up, uh, this would become a very, very difficult uh, situation for the, for the Icelandic banks, as it proved in the end that liquidity problems really killed them in the autumn of 2008. In 2006, there were also clear signs that something bad was about to happen. But the key decisions that led to these uh, problems were made in 2004 and 2005 when the banks borrowed these vast sums of money from abroad. So probably the point of no return was end of 2005. At the end of 2005, it was very difficult to unwind this. Um, and at that point, there were no warning signals um, when that happened. Uh, to some extent, of course, and that's in the nature of bubbles, <laughs> is that all politicians, they, they deny the, um, the possibility that there is a bubble because they, they only see the good signs. They never see the, uh, the worrying signs. And that's in human nature. And, uh, and, and, and it's not confined to politicians alone, it's the same with, with, uh, uh, with the uh, economists who, uh, most of them, failed to see uh, what was happening uh, and the inherent risks in the system, both here and in other countries. Financiële crisissen vergen op korte tijd door tastende maatregelen. In het weekend van 4 en 5 oktober 2008 neemt de IJslandse regering een noodwet aan die moet voorkomen dat het financieel systeem en de economie volledig instorten. You, you split the domestic operations of each bank from its foreign operations. And uh, to let the domestic payment system continue, so the cash machines would continue. And uh, secondly, you change the priority ordering among the creditors so that uh, depositors would have priority over bondholders, meaning when the assets of these banks would be sold, the depositors would get the money first before foreign banks. And uh, 
this has helped a lot. So the, it has shifted the, the, the losses to foreign banks from depositors, both local and foreign depositors. Wegens de maatregelen van de regering om de eigen burgers financieel zoveel mogelijk te beschermen, staan buitenlandse schuldeisers in de kou. Onder zware buitenlandse druk neemt het IJslandse parlement eind december 2008 een wet aan die garandeert dat de eerste 20.000 euro van elk buitenlands particulier spaartegoed bij een IJslandse bank gedekt is. President Grimson weigert de wet te ondertekenen die de IJslandse burger mede verantwoordelijk maakt voor de schulden van de bankiers. Duizenden IJslanders beginnen aan dagenlange betogingen tegen de regering van Gerhaarde. Er wordt met stenen gegooid, de politie gebruikt traangas en betogers worden opgepakt. Om IJslandse toestanden. We are going to sing the hate song. Yes. It's in Icelandic. It was made uh, in the crisis, when everybody was hating. Yes. We did a lot of hating. Yeah. So we uh, try to embrace that uh, feeling, that negative feeling, and instead of uh, punching our friends in the faces, just to sing it and mm -hmm. release it uh, with songs. And it's, in our minds, it's not only a song. It's a whole business plan. Yes. So that if you have enemies, you can pay us money, and we go to their house and sing the hate song to them, yeah, from you. And the line that we repeat again and again is just, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. But we mean it, you know, every single time. Door de diepe crisis zoekt men in de grondwet naar aansprakelijkheden en oplossingen. Die staan er niet in. Daardoor ontstaat de gedachte om de grondwet drastisch aan te passen. In opdracht van het parlement wordt een grondwettelijke raad van 25 burgers opgericht. 25 gewone burgers die geen lid zijn van een politieke partij. Zij moeten een nieuwe grondwet voorstellen aan het parlement. Ik denk dat een obvious issue or point is dat we have to have more participation in the decision making process from the people. That the public should have a voice in decision making. And in that sense, I think that this uh, discussion about the constitution, it could help us to, to identify those issues that are necessary for us to improve as a society. So the pressure was basically not coming from the politicians, but from the people. And then the politicians decided to establish a special forum for revision, revising the constitution as such. Salveur Nordal was voorzitter van de Grondwettelijke Raad die de IJslandse Grondwet moest herzien. When we started working, we decided to have a, an open website uh, have the, our ideas posted on the website as soon as possible so people could see what we were thinking of. Uh, and then they, our ideas, of course, changed from one week to another. People could comment uh, both through the social media and also send in uh, sort of more thorough uh, suggestions. And, uh, and many, when people were sort of commenting th through Facebook, many of, of the constitutional members were commenting back, so there was a kind of a dialogue there. W once we started, we noticed especially a lot of interest from abroad. People were thinking, you know, what, what, what is going on here? And lots of, of media for, from abroad came and, and asked us ab about the, uh, this. And, and then we realized that this was probably more 
uh, new than, than we had realized to start with. Like besides the money issues, is 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 just uh, go your go your own way, kind of. In, instead of following the herd, following everyone, you kind of have to stop for a moment and think, where do I want to go? I think the best thing that happened to me is that. I couldn't work on the marketing department in the last bank anymore. I think if I would still be working there, I wouldn't be as happy as I am now. <laughs> High five. <laughs> we had eindelijk ons 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 uh, onze natuur achtergelaten. We waren we waren heel metropolitan geworden. Het was eindelijk allemaal voor de voor 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 de mater. Het was een ongelooflijke materialistische uh, leefwereld geworden. These are life-changing events. You have everything going upside down. Unemployment skyrocketing. You never know where the bottom is when you're going into the crisis. You have to draw the lesson that, that you have to work differently. We have to have different politics. We have to have better politics that are more conducive to bringing better results, bringing everyone to the table, building greater harmony, in our society, and I think that's also a lesson that, that all Europe is confronted with. I have to say that the values in life, or the, this greed and the money values, have changed. Uh, for me, uh, they have changed a lot. Not because of the, the crisis and stuff like that, just because uh, the music, uh, being a musician and, and working like I'm working now at, at the youth center, it's uh, it changed the, how you look at life. It's there are things that are more important than money in life, and that, yeah, so I think, I th that's, I think uh, that actually happened to lots of people. They they started thinking about less about the money and more about being happy, I guess. If there was a lesson to be learned from this, it would be just a lesson to be normal, like we're like everyone else, and uh, be part of the world <laughs> with all our weaknesses and, uh, and also some strengths. And, uh, yeah. But very sturdy people who don't give up easily, you know, because we, for a thousand years lived on this island and through very rough conditions. You know, the, We have to give ourselves time to, to uh, re-evaluate what is important to us. And, and when we have, then we can look back and say, OK, we did this wrong. Icelanders are more careful now than they were before the collapse, clearly, because the attitude towards, you know, collecting, taking loans has changed a lot. So I think that if you're talking about thin line that Iceland are I think the public in general are less willing to, to put things at risk. I think on a family level, it has brought us closer together. It has also torn us apart. Uh, it's very clear that, that the recent years that we have had considerable strife, we have had arguments, uh, accusations flowing uh, to and forth. It has created a lot of distrust and criticism towards government and, and politics, and which is very good and understandable, but I think that Icelanders now need to look a bit ahead and focus on 
something which is uniting us and try to build up trust to our main institutions because our democracy is depending on that for in the long run. We're sort of a miniature version of the world. And so what Europe is dealing with now is, uh, is in some sense similar. And so there are lessons for other countries of what happened here. And, uh, and I think the main lesson for other countries is that uh, this country now is doing quite well in terms of unemployment, output, and this country is, you could say it's almost booming, but not quite, but it's, it's getting out of this mess. I think the Icelanders are no different from other people on this planet. They have learned very little from what happened. They will uh, forget slowly what should have been learned and should have been really put in terms. And I think there will be another crash within too long. We have the knowledge and, uh, and uh, we should have the possibility to, to build a better future. Ze zeggen altijd, een, 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 een ijzel stoot zich geen twee keer aan, aan, aan de steen, zeker in België. Maar ik denk wel dat een, ik ben een beetje bang dat een IJslander dat, 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 dat drie keer zal moeten doen voordat het volledig uh, eruit is. Oké, okay, we, we should have done things differently. And sort of start to, to look forward and, and look into the future. How we are going to, how we see IJsland, how we see IJsland after five years, after ten years, after fifteen years. And, and stop blaming ourselves. If there is something we know from the last several hundred years all over Europe and the Western world is that we will experience bubbles again and we will experience financial crisis again. Our task is to minimize that risk for the public, but we can never, never eliminate it.